This morning's scripture reading is taken from the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, 6th chapter, verses 11 through 16. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we in this Advent season celebrate the Word made flesh, the miracle of the incarnation, we give you thanks for your Word in the Scriptures. And we pray this morning that you would be with our brother as he opens this Word to us. Father, pour out your Spirit upon him in extra measure Speak to us through him that we might be changed, that we might be turned more and more into the image of our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As I shared with the first service, I just have to start with an apology. Uh, I am responsible for the weather outside today. (laughs) This is, we have family who've come in from out of town and every time we do, this is what happens. So I apologize to all of you who are coming down here for the beautiful South Florida weather and this is what you got. I I should have let you know that my family was coming. In any case, the weather outside is a little bit of a picture, a little bit of reflection of the experience of my own soul this week. Just to be honest with you, I found myself struggling a bit early this week in my walk with Christ, experiencing some challenges, some difficulty. It, it, I, I think as I reflected on it in hindsight, I think it was a combination of things. One, it was coming off of the high of this great spiritual experience in Southeast Asia and seeing the Lord at work and then returning to sort of the the regular challenges of everyday life and ministry. I think some of it was fed by jet lag and the fact that I can't seem to sleep at regular times and wake up at regular times. And some of it was just plain spiritual warfare. And so I found myself on a familiar road that I've been down many times before. The road is marked by things like self-pity, feelings of helplessness, feeling like I'm a victim, and feeling like Well, maybe you're familiar with the road. I don't have to describe it for you. But in any case, I found myself on that road. And as I was going down that road, I've walked with Jesus long enough to know that that I should do something. And so I thought, I I I should pray. And as soon as I thought I should pray, I then thought to myself, what am I gonna pray for? What's prayer really gonna do? And then I thought, well, I should read God's word. And then I thought, why am I going to read God's word? I already know what's in there. But I'm dutiful and it felt like my duty to read the word. And so I opened it up to my reading for the day, which was from the uh, minor prophet Zephaniah. Probably in full disclosure, I was not excited about my Bible reading that day because I was in Zephaniah, which is not one of my go-to passages typically. Nevertheless, it is God's holy and inspired word and it is living and active and he ministered to me right from this little obscure minor prophet. And these are the words that I read. Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. 
The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I was tempted to just read over that, but the Lord stopped me right in my tracks as I read those words and it was just like a a bolt right through me where suddenly out of the midst of my fog and sort of dreariness, there was a light and and I could see the truth again and I remembered who my God is. And I remembered who I am. And I remembered that, that this God that I worship, he's right here in my midst. These words that he wrote to his people many years ago to encourage them, he spoke right to me. He's with me. He loves me. He rejoices over me. He's here for me. If he's with me, nobody can stand against me. All of these things. And I started to thank him for who he is and to praise him for what he's done. And, and it, was, it was that fast. And what I, what I remembered, and maybe what you need to know is if you're in that dreary, drowsy, sort of bleak place spiritually today, all it takes is just a word from him, just a touch, and he can pull you out of that so fast, you won't believe you were even there. And I pray that for you as well. But then as I was reflecting on this and I was rejoicing in it, I went over to the hymnal that I keep nearby in my times of personal worship and and I opened it up to a hymn from the 8th century. And this is what I read. Christian, dost thou see them on the holy ground? How the powers of darkness rage thy steps around. Christian, up and smite them, counting gain but loss in the strength that cometh by the holy cross. I was reminded that I'm in a spiritual conflict. There is a battle that rages around me every single day. I'm not immune to spiritual warfare. And I was succumbing to it without even being cognizant of the fact that it was happening. And so these words remind me, engage the fight. D- don't you see the, the reality of what's happening around you? Don't you see that the discouragement and the despair that you feel is, is not from the Lord? Don't you see that it's a spiritual battle you're engaged in? Up and smite them. And how do we smite them? He tells us it's by the Holy Cross. It's, it's through the truth of the gospel. It's through what God has accomplished for us in the person of Jesus. This is available to you. Real power right now. And I continued reading, Christian, dost thou feel them? How they work within, striving, tempting, luring, goading into sin? Christian, never tremble, never be downcast. Gird thee for the battle. Watch and pray and fast. It's a battle. You feel those powers that work within? Up and smite them. Watch and pray and fast. The spiritual disciplines. Put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet fitted ready with the, the gospel message, shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Each piece we put on with prayer to engage in this conflict. But you know what? I forgot I was in a conflict, so I wasn't even thinking about the fight. And maybe I'm not the only one who's forgotten that we're in a conflict, that it's a battle. To be sure, the battle we fight today, our spiritual fight is not a battle for our own salvation. We're not fighting to win the victory for our salvation. Jesus has won the definitive victory for your salvation through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Our fight is to stand by faith in the victory he's won. To stand there, to not be shaken from it, to not be moved, to not be drawn away, to not walk away, but to stand in the truth of what Jesus has accomplished and in our identity as his children, his beloved, his bride. But it helps to be cognizant of the fact that we're in the fight. And so that's what Paul is getting at in this passage. He's reminding us that there's a battle here, that we're all engaged in a, in a warfare and, and life in the household of God means life in the midst of battle. We need to be prepared for that battle. And in the midst of that battle, there are some things we need to do actively. The Christian life is not a passive life where we simply hope for salvation, though we do hope for it. Our hope for salvation propels us forward to flee from sin, 
to pursue righteousness and to fight for the eternal life to which we've been called. So what I want to share with you this morning are three things we are called to do, three ways we're called to be active in the Christian life, the power for which we find, and three things that are true that we need to know and be reminded of this morning. So let me start with the first three things. The first thing is that the godly, those who are part of the household of God, who call in the name of Jesus, the godly flee from sin and temptation. This passage starts with the word but, which means you kind of have to know what happened before this to understand what he's talking about when he says, flee these things. But what he's talking about, we saw last week, that there are false teachers who enter the church and teach in various ways that godliness is not an end in its own right, but it's a means to another end. And in this particular case, what they were teaching was that godliness is a means to financial gain. So live the Christian life, not because God is worthy of that, but because by doing so, you can get what you really want, which is more money, more wealth, or maybe it's a cushy life. Whatever it happens to be, we see godliness as a means to all different sorts of kinds of gain. And what Paul tells us is, no, 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 it's godliness with contentment that's gain. So he warns us against the danger of discontent. He warns us against the danger of covetousness, of desiring to have that which belongs to another or which we simply don't have. And he tells us in that passage that those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare. He says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Now, some of you might have come away from last week thinking that I was advocating that you should be poor. I was not advocating that. What Paul's advocating is not poverty over wealth, but contentment over covetousness. It's contentment. Whether we have much or whether we have little, we're learning, as Paul did, to be content with what we have. That's the safe harbor from the protection of the destruction that comes when we fall in love with money or when we desire to be richer than we are right now. I had a guy come up to me after the first service who I know and love who said, I pray every day that God will give me more money. I said, really? And I know this is a, is a godly man. And, and I said, really, you pray that? And he said, yeah, I do. Because I give it all away. There are, there are the godly rich, but there aren't the godly who desire to be rich in the covetous way that Paul describes. So this is what he says He says, as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee the desire to be rich. Flee the love of money. Flee the covetousness that drives so much of the activity and the things that we do today. Flee these things. There are a number of things that the apostle tells us to flee in the scripture. He tells us to flee sexual immorality. He tells us to flee from idolatry. He tells us to flee from youthful passions. And here he says, flee the love of money and the desire to be rich. Maybe you remember those words from Kenny Rogers who says, you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. Know when to walk away and know when to run. And Paul says, this is one of those times when you run. You flee from this sin. Uh, Jocko Willink was a Navy SEAL. He teaches self-defense. He's got a podcast, writes some stuff. In any case, in talking about self-defense, he says that the best self-defense is the ability to run, to flee, which is why I hang out with these pastors here at Covenant, because I know if we ever get in trouble, I'm faster than all of them. (laughs) To run. This is what he says. He says, if someone attacks me and they want to punch or kick me, I can just run away. They're not holding on to me. I can get away from them. It's when someone grabs you that you need some technique to get out of there. So the, so the first best self-defense is not to get taken hold of, but to run away before it happens. Well, that's what Paul's saying about the love of money and the desire to be rich and covetousness. He says, don't let it get a hold of you. Flee these things. Run as fast as you can. When you see them coming, you see them rising in your heart, Run. Don't stay a toe-to-toe. Don't say, as we were saying last week, well, I'm one of those few people who can handle the love of money and I'm, it, won't, it won't capture me. It won't lead me into destruction. 
Flee. Run from it. Well, how practically do we flee from these things? First of all, we need to be on guard for them. We need to be on guard as you're walking through this world. Remember, we're in a battle. That means that the enemy is going to be using tactics to try to bring you down. He wants to grab hold of you. He knows that the love of money has made shipwreck of many people's faith. So be on guard for this. It's coming for you. Practically, that means if you're a shopaholic, for example, watch out when you're at the store. Watch out when you go to Amazon. It means if the people that you hang out with, the major source of their conversation is money and the things it can buy, you probably should also hang out with some other people whose life doesn't consist in the abundance of their possessions. Brothers and sisters, there is not a single piece of marketing that exists out there today which is designed to help you be content with what you have. (laughs) Not one single piece. Our economy thrives on your covetousness and mine. So we need to be on guard for this. We need to be aware that this is happening. We need to be intentional to not let it grab hold of us because it will destroy us. Secondly, bring it to the light. Bring it to the light. Sin thrives in the dark and the love of money is sin. And the desire to be rich is sin. These sins and temptations, they thrive in the dark. And so we've got, to, we've got to bring them to the light. We've got to share with one another. Again, I'm not talking about being rich. I'm not saying that's a sin. I'm saying that, that when we desire more, is that covetous this desire. To share it with another. James says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. It's helpful to share it, to bring it to the light. And it loses its power when we do that. Three. Give radically. The best antidote, the best antidote to our covetousness and our, and our endless desire for more and our dissatisfaction, discontent is actually to give things away. You see, the lie of discontentment again is if you just have this, if you just have a little more of this, or if you just have a different this, you'll be happy and you'll be satisfied. Never delivers. And if you want to just drive a knife right through the heart of that lie, when you're feeling that desire to have something else, actually give something away. It gives something important away. Give something you really like away. Give something sacrificially away. And you'll discover the truth of scripture that it actually is better to give than to receive. Radical generosity cuts at the heart of covetousness and the desire to have ever more. And you'll discover like that gentleman did that maybe you do start asking for more, but it's actually just so you can have more to give away. And discover again the joy of giving. The godly flee from sin and temptation, particularly the temptation to love of money and the desire for wealth. Secondly, the godly pursue what is good. The godly pursue what is good. He writes in verse 11, this next line, he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Why does he say to actively pursue these things? He says, You need to pursue them because they're not coming for you. You have to go after them. Love of money's coming for you. The desire to be rich, it's coming for you. Lust, covetousness, all of these things, they're coming for you. The enemy wants these things for you. He doesn't want godliness, righteousness, and so you have to go after these things. You have to want them. You have to desire them. You have to pursue them. They're virtues. They have to be cultivated. They have to be learned. They have to be habits that are practiced and developed. And they all come from a root of spiritual life. So here's what happens in the life of a person. Before you know Christ, you're dead in your sin. It doesn't mean that everything you do is bad and and terrible or that there's not great qualities about you and great traits. But what Paul is talking about here is the product of spiritual life. That when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he causes you to be born again and you have new desires. You actually desire righteousness. You actually desire godliness. You desire steadfastness and, and, and generosity and all of these traits and these fruits of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit does in your life. But even as he's doing that work, you still have a, you have a, you have a job to do. 
In other places, he says, not only do you have to put off the old man, but you have to put on the new. Not only do you have to say no to ungodliness, but you have to say yes to godliness. So there's an active cultivation. There's an active pursuit of these the new desires that the Holy Spirit has given us. We have to put on these traits of righteousness and godliness and so on. So we might sum it up this way. The Christian life isn't just ceasing to do what is evil, but it's learning to do what is good. We're putting off the old, we're putting on the new. We're putting off uh, love of money and desire to be rich and all those things that we talked about. And instead, we're pursuing these other traits. Let's talk about them for a moment. Righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness is treating other people rightly. It's, it's, it's the same word for justice. It means treating people rightly, treating people fairly as they deserve to be treated. Godliness speaks to a reverence for God that finds expression in the way that we live in regards to him and with other people. Both of these things, righteousness and godliness, cut the heart out of covetousness. You see, because we're not interested in using people for what we can gain from them. We're interested in treating them rightly and fairly. We're not interested in worshiping money. We're reverencing God and we're using money for his purposes. He says, faith. And love, faith teaches us to rely not on ourselves, but on God. And love reminds us that we're not after our own interests, but we're actually looking after the interests of others. And that the resources that God has entrusted to us are after our needs are met for helping meet the needs of other people. Steadfastness and gentleness. Steadfastness speaks of a, of a consistency of uh, the ability to, to endure in the midst of hardship, trial, or times of want. Gentleness speaks of an ability to be patient with people who are difficult, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. All of these things, they don't come naturally to us. We have to pursue them. We have to be intentional about cultivating them because they're not our natural reaction to hardship, to want, and so on. So how do we pursue these things? Well, throughout the ages, Christians have recognized the importance of the traditional spiritual disciplines, that we need to be people who read God's word and not only read it, but actually do what it says. That we need to be people of prayer, where we're reminded about who God is and what's true and what's required of us and how we're called to live in this world. But not only these things, we need community. He says in 2 Timothy 2.22, in a very similar passage to this one, he says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You see, you need not only to pursue these things, but you need to pursue these things along with others who are calling on the Lord. If you're seeking to pursue righteousness and love and all of these, these fruit of the spirit and these, these virtues, if you're pursuing these on your own, you're doing so explicitly contrary to the word that tells you to pursue them. You need the church. You need brothers and sisters in Christ around you who desire these same things. Because there's a whole lot of influences around you that are pulling you a different direction. And we need to surround ourselves with people and rub close shoulders with people who are helping us remember the things we want to be about. Righteousness, love, steadfastness, gentleness, and so on. He doesn't give us an explicit how-to, but this is what he does. He says, simply says, we're simply to run from evil as we run from danger and to run after goodness as we run after success. Run from evil like you run from danger. Run after goodness like you run after success. This is a crowd that probably doesn't have to be told to run after success. Many of you ran after it and you found it. You grabbed it. You took hold of it. The call for us is to pursue godliness with the same vigor, the same intentionality, the same earnest desire, the same doggedness, the same unwilling to quit, to let up, to give up pursue these things, and then to bring others along with you in the pursuit. That's what we want covenant to be, a community that is pursuing godliness together. Thirdly, the godly fight the good fight. The godly fight the good fight. He says in verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. 
take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of the faith. This is probably a call for Timothy to stand for the truth of the gospel, the faith that's been once delivered. Let nothing come in to corrupt it. There were already false teachers in Ephesus who were corrupting the gospel. It's been the reality throughout the whole history of the church that the gospel is always under attack. There's always efforts to skew it, to remove key parts of it, to add new things to it. And the Christian is to stand and to fight. Isn't that interesting? With regard to temptation, he doesn't say fight, he says flee. But when it comes to the distortion of the gospel, he doesn't say flee, he says fight. Don't let the gospel go down on your watch. Don't let the gospel go down in your house. Don't let the gospel go down in your church. I'm not talking about variations on side matters and secondary issues and having different opinions about this matter or that matter. I'm talking about the heart of the gospel. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, lived a sinless life, crucified on the cross for the sins of his people, risen again from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, reigning at the right hand of God and coming again to judge the world. These truths, that we are saved by grace through faith, in Christ alone. Let nothing distort the gospel. Fight the good fight of the faith. And he goes on. There's another aspect to this fight, a struggle. He says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold of the eternal life to which you've been called. There's both an active and a passive component to this, isn't there? He says eternal life is something you've been called to. If you possess eternal life, you possess it because God called you. He effectually called you. You heard the gospel message. The Holy Spirit worked in your heart. He caused you to see your helpless condition. He caused you to see the sufficiency of Christ, your Savior. And you responded and said, I believe. I want to follow Jesus. You've been called to this. Timothy made that good confession. You've made that good confession. If you're a member of this church or some church, you stood up and you said, I'm a follower of Jesus. He's my savior, my Lord. Timothy made that good confession. He had the gift of eternal life, but Paul says, take hold of it. What's he talking about here? He already possesses. If you're a Christian, you already possess eternal life. What does he mean when he says, take hold of the eternal life to which you've been called? Here's what I think he's saying. Eternal life is not just something we experience after death. It's a reality we participate in now by faith. It's another word for the abundant life. It's what I was missing when I was down in the doldrums earlier this week. I wasn't taking hold of the eternal life that Jesus purchased for me, that God called me to. And we take hold of that eternal life by faith, moment by moment. We preach the gospel to ourselves. We remember what's true. We remember that we're engaged in a conflict, that Satan's desire, the world's desire, our flesh desires to drag us down. But we must stand in this faith, in this eternal life that he's given to us that begins right now. You see, eternal life is to know him. It's to know him. And that's our possession right now. We want to fight and keep hold of that, to not let that slip from our grasp in the midst of the struggle that we face day in and day out. So that's the call. The godly, they flee from sin and temptation. They run fast as they can before it gets hold of them. They pursue what's good intentionally, actively, and along with other believers they fight the good fight of the faith, recognizing that one of the enemy's favorite tactics is to distort the truth of the gospel message that sets people free. And by faith, they live in the present moment, taking hold of the eternal life to which they've been called. Now, wherein do we find the, the motivation, the, know, the knowledge, the, the power for this? And I want to say it's here, that we do this because the godly know God's power God's promise and God's presence. God's presence, his power, his promise. Let's start with this. The godly know God's promise. Paul gives us this slew of words that we're gonna cover a lot faster than we covered what we've already been through. 
in 13 to 16. I just want to read this for you. And I want you to just watch the apostle as he's writing these instructions and he's talking about his God and his savior and how he gets caught up in talking about this. He forgets he's writing a letter. He's just flat out worshiping the God who's revealed. This is how he does. He says, I charge you, Timothy, and by extension, the church at Ephesus and by extension, the church in Naples, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and it's like he, he looks up and he's, yeah, yeah, I was, I was writing right? I was writing a letter. He just gets caught up because it is in his knowledge of God. And the first piece of it we see here is the knowledge of God's promise. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus. And what he's getting at is you're to keep the commandment unstained, the gospel commandment, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This, you, you, to keep it unstained until Jesus comes. To live a life consistent with your confession that you made. The promise is Jesus is coming. We're not told when. He says that he's coming at God's appointed time. All we know is that he's coming, but that is to be motivation enough to make us watchful, to make us be intentional about waiting and to living faithfully until he appears. To live faithfully in the midst of the warfare and the opposition, to stand firm in the faith in which we stand, knowing that when Jesus comes, the battle will be over. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor's song. But this is the day of battle. And so we must stand, we must fight, and we hold on to the promise that when Jesus returns with just the breath of his mouth, he will slay all his enemies and the fight is over. It, it, just like what happened to me earlier this week in reading the word, I'm down, I'm in the battle, I'm not even realizing it. Boom, just a word from him, everything changes. So it will be at the end. Death, no more. Satan, all his enemies, cast into the lake of fire, is finished. The godly know God's promise and it motivates them to flee from sin, to pursue what's good, to fight the good fight. Secondly, they know God's presence. They know God's presence. Paul's charge in verse 13, he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. God is the source of life. When the philosopher asked the question, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is God. He's the source of life. He's the alone source of life. No one else, nothing else has life of its own. It's him alone who has life in himself. And it's he who's the source of all life throughout this whole universe. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of him. Now, what's interesting about the presence of God is that it's an absolute terror to his enemies. But for those who know him and love him, his presence is the fullness of joy. In fact, his presence is heaven. In the beginning, God created us to live in his presence. To live in the Garden of Eden was to live in the place where you lived in the very presence of God and walked with him and talked with him and fellowshiped with him in the day. But when our first parents rebelled against God, they were put out of his presence. And not only them, but all of their posterity, including you and me. We're not born in the presence of God today. We're born in the presence of our enemies. And actually, we are sided with our enemies against God. The beautiful story of the Bible is that from the very third chapter of the book all the way to the end, it's a story about how God in his love sought to bring us back into his presence. 
Because how can a people who are sinful and rebellious live in the presence of a holy God? Throughout the Bible, we discover that when the unholy enters the presence of the holy, it's bad news for the unholy. So how can God bring us into his presence without destroying us in his holiness? And the answer that plays out throughout the scripture is that he himself is going to come and take on flesh. He's going to identify with humanity. He's going to become one of us. He's going to live a perfect life of obedience, fully in the presence of God, but then he's going to die on the cross being forsaken by his father. And that forsakenness was not for his own sin, but it was for the sin of all of his people. Jesus was put outside the camp, so to speak. He was put out of the presence of God and his goodness, and he suffered the full wrath of God on the cross for our sins. And the effect of that is that for all who trust in Jesus, your sin has been taken away. And so even though you're still a person who continues to sin, God counts you as righteous as Jesus, and you can actually, as a person who still sins, be declared holy and dwell in the presence of a holy God. That's the great mystery of the Bible and the incarnation and our salvation, to dwell in his presence. And Paul says, I charge you, in light of the presence of the God who gives life to all things, and not only God the Father, but of Jesus Christ, who in the presence of Pilate made the good confession. What was the good confession? Well, you can read it in all the Gospels. But when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. Knowing that by saying this, he would seal his fate to go to the cross and to die. Jesus fought the good fight. Jesus fled from sin. Jesus pursued what is good for you and for me and for our salvation. And so it's in light of this, Paul says, you too keep the commandment unstained. You too take up the fight. You too strengthen your weary hands and your weak knees and engage in this for look what Jesus has accomplished for you. The presence of God is a spur to us to flee from sin, to pursue what is good and to fight the good fight. Finally, the godly know God's power. They know his power. Look what he says, that this God He's the blessed and only sovereign. I just want to remind you, there's one sovereign power in the universe. There's one power alone that doesn't answer to any other power. It's not Satan. It's not demons. It's not your depression. It's not your addiction. It's not any president or king. It is the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. There's one sovereign power. And he does all his holy will, and none can stop him. And this God has determined by his grace to be for you. And so Paul can say, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Let me just give you a scope of his power. I was reading about the distance between the earth and the sun. It's 93 million miles. And if you were to compress that distance into the width of a sheet of paper, the distance between Earth and the next closest star would be a stack of papers 71 feet high. The distance be, uh, between Earth and the end of the Milky Way or the diameter across the Milky Way, is a stack of paper 310 miles high. The distance between here and the edge of the universe, as best we know, is a stack of paper 31 million miles high, with each stack of paper representing 93 million miles the scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ upholds this universe by the word of his power. And he has determined to use that power for you and your salvation and your good and your conformity to his image. Do you know that power? 
The scripture calls it the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's at work in you. Do you know this power? It's for you. Take hold of this. It's for you. by faith. Stand in this power, brothers and sisters. Do you know his presence? Do you know his promise? Do you know his power for you? If so, flee from sin. Flee from temptation. Pursue what is good. Fight the good fight. Take hold of the eternal life to which you've been called. And to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the Savior, who came, the immortal God who put on mortality that we might have eternal life. The invisible God who put on flesh that we might see him and know him and love him. We thank you for your astounding, astonishing love displayed toward a sinful people that would cause you to give your only son to die on the cross that we might be saved and have eternal life. Thank you. We receive him again with new joy this morning. We accept him. And Lord, in knowing these things, the truth of your power and your presence and your promise, we take up the fight once again. We, we no longer go on allowing sin and Satan, the world, the flesh, to beat us up, but we stand in the victory you've won for us. Continue to encourage us in it and help us to encourage one another to that end. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his glory, amen.